I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the sixth chapter of Luke's Gospel. And as you're turning there, I want to share with you, I was disappointed is not the word, maybe correct it is. When I looked at our bulletin, I saw our offertory hymn, Lord, lay some soul upon... I thought we were about to hear a James Brown tune for <laughs> just a second, but uh, I think Marilyn kind of picked us up there, so no, thank you. But no, acquired and Linnell, thank you, as always. Luke chapter 6, uh, we're going to begin in verse 27, read through verse 38 there. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful." Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, help us to hear what you would have us to hear, so that we may do what you call us to do, Lord, so we may be the people you call us to be. We pray in Christ's name, amen. One word which sums up the basis of all good conduct, loving kindness. Do not do to others what you do not want done to yourself. That sound familiar? It sounds like Jesus' words before us this morning. Yet they were spoken 500 years and thousands of miles away from Jesus. The Chinese philosopher Confucius spoke these words, which were later included in a compilation of his teachings after his death called the Analects over 500 years before Jesus. Around the same time as Confucius, but in a different part of Asia, another spiritual leader spoke these words, Treat not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. His name was Siddhartha Gautama. You may know him better as the Buddha. Of course, it just wasn't ancient Asian sages who shared this way of thinking. Chief Dan George, chief of the Slil Waiutooth Nation in Canada for most of the 20th century, was noted for saying this. He said, we are as much alive as we keep the earth alive. Even the prophet Muhammad, 600 years after Jesus, the founder of Islam, is quoted in the Hadith, the collection of his sayings, as saying, not one of you truly believes until you wish for others what you wish for yourself. This philosophy, this ethical imperative is shared across the major religions of the world and has been for most, if not all, of human existence. In fact, religious scholar and a former nun, Karen Armstrong, called for a revival of this golden rule uh, just a few years ago when she won the TED Prize in 2008 for her Charter for Compassion. It was a document that she shared with religious and political leaders around the world, calling them to sign 
to recommit themselves to the golden rule. In the year before she won the Ted Prize, she said this, What we need is a new kind of religious discourse that goes back to the core values of the religion. Every single one is based on compassion and on the golden rule, first pronounced by Confucius 500 years before Christ. Do not do to others what you would not like them to do to you. Look into your own heart, discover what it is that gives you pain, and then refuse under any circumstance to inflict that pain on anybody else. And then Karen says, this is civilization. The golden rule is the basis of civilization. Not technology, not urban development, not gathering together, not even controlled fire. The golden rule. All of the major religions of the world are based upon it. Karen Armstrong says it's the basis of civilization. And just about everybody I know agrees it's a good idea. So why? Why in the world was Jesus crucified for it? It wasn't even a new idea for Jesus. Now, I know when we read the Bible, we like to think it's, it, it just fell out of heaven like that, that nobody ever said anything like it before. But, but Jesus didn't say a lot of original stuff. I mean, it wasn't even original to his people. About 100 years before Jesus, a, a rabbi named Hillel the Elder was once asked uh, by a man, he said, I will convert if you can quote to me the whole Torah while I stand on one foot. And Hillel said, well, here it is. What is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Go and learn it. Jesus didn't say anything new, shocking, or even all that radical, really. So, so why? Why'd they kill him? Why'd they want to throw him off a cliff in his hometown? Why did the Pharisees make this strange political alliance with the Herodians to kill him? Why did the Sadducees plot against him? Why did the Romans want to keep him quiet? If he's not saying anything so wildly outlandish and crazy, why does he wind up executed? And don't brush that off with that trite thing. Well, it was part of God's plan. Why? He was executed by a mob of religious folks and politically provoked people. But why? What is it about Jesus' particular take on the golden rule that had folks so up in arms then and still has them sort of bubbling over today? I have a hunch. When I was in college, even in seminary, even now in doctoral work, most of my coursework involved writing papers. Now, I know everybody has to write papers in college, but we almost exclusively wrote papers. I can only recall a handful of times where we took actual exams or quizzes or anything like that. And most of those were in classes outside of my major. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter how many papers we had written. There was always that one person in class who would say the same thing every time an assignment was given. Now, the syllabus of the prof might say something like, write an eight to ten page paper discussing Jürgen Moltmann's view of the Trinity in relation to the broader theological perspectives of his contemporaries. And inevitably, someone would raise their hand and ask, hey, prof, is it okay? Is it okay if we just get on to page eight or do you want eight full pages? Do, does it matter what font? Does it have to be Times New Roman or can we use Curry or New? If you get that, you probably used Courier New at some point. Just one inch margins, double spec, can it be two and a half inch, two, two and a half spaces, one and a half inch margin? I use Word Perfect and it's automatically set to that. Is that okay? Is that okay? You know why they were asking, right? It wasn't because they had f refined their thinking down to just a handful of sentences. It wasn't because they were concerned that all their knowledge on the subject could be contained with, within the parameters of the assignment. It was because they wanted to get away with as much as they could while doing as little as they could. Even if it meant cheating, cheating a bit on the size of the font and the width of the margins. And aren't we all just a little bit guilty of that? When the rules are laid out before us, we, we tweak them just a little bit to fit our comfort. I remember when I was in junior college in a speech class, we had a police officer from Enterprise there. 
He gave his speech on radar equipment. He said, yeah, this stuff is kind of fuzzy. We don't usually pull over people unless they're going 10 miles an hour. Everybody rent down, 10 miles an hour, it's okay. We fudge on that sort of stuff to make it fit our expectations. Like the woman I heard at the restaurant who said to the waitress when she came, I know, I know the menu only says for 12 and under, but, but can I get the grilled chicken and french fries? Oh, sure. Most of that stuff is harmless. Doesn't have any real effect on the rotation of the earth or the well-being of another soul. But this proclivity of humankind isn't relegated just to the page limit of term papers and whether or not you can order off the kids menu. I mean, how many times in your life has someone bent the rules for you and it made all the difference? Held the door open just a little bit longer. Wound the clock back just a few more minutes. Put your resume on top of the pile even though you were a day late. How many times were doors locked to keep brown faces from coming in during business hours? How many times had someone been pulled out of line for a random search at the airport? How many times have the rules been so clearly stated, so publicly displayed, only to have them ignored for the advantage of one and strictly enforced for the disadvantage of another? How many times have we backed our way out of the obvious implications of something so direct, so clear, by muddying the waters with our own so-called interpretations. For hundreds of years, religious traditions, their leaders, and their scriptures held to the golden rule as the human standard for moral practices, and yet Jesus comes along, says it, and is crucified, executed by the government at the insistence of the religious majority. All because he too preached a gospel grounded in the golden rule. So what was so different when it came to Jesus? Well, Jesus, I think, erased the room for our self-centered commentary on the rule itself. With Jesus' teaching of the golden rule, there's no room to, to carry on in the seemingly unending cycle of retributive violence that has defined humanity really since they're from the beginning, and, and sadly still does. Jesus says, but I say to you that will listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Now, now I'm not that old, but I can remember when I was growing up being taught by folks, folks that I highly admired and respected, folks I thought who had their, their stuff together, I remember being taught by them that the way a man was to operate in the world is if somebody hits you, hurts you, abuses you, or cuts you off, you hit them back just a little bit harder to let them know you don't mean, you mean business. I was raised and told that if somebody hurts you, you hurt them back just enough so they'll leave you alone. That's what a man does. Why, I even heard some Christians Say things like, sometimes the best way to show someone you love them is to tell them what they did wrong and punish them. That's part of that interpretation we sort of wedge in there. But Jesus takes all the air out of that, doesn't he? If anyone strikes you on the cheek, don't hit them back. Don't tell them, you ain't supposed to do that. Jesus says, if anyone strikes you on the cheek, Offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, coat, do not withhold even your shirt. It's as if Jesus says in no uncertain terms, love even your enemies, even to the point of being beaten and stripped naked. Jesus' teaching on the golden rule clearly calls for us to widen our circle of concern, to understand that it's a universal principle applied to all of humanity, not just those down the road and around the corner. He says, give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. There it is, plain as day, the golden rule but given in the context of giving to everyone. And in case there's any confusion on the matter, Jesus says, if you love those who love you, so what? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, 
Who cares? Even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what good does that do a soul? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. I get the feeling Jesus says that because he can already hear their conversations in the crowd. Already see their self-centered interpretations coming. Well, we do love our neighbors. We love our families. We take care of our own right here in this house, around this table, in this community, in this area. But Jesus calls them to draw that circle ever wider. Calls us to draw our circles ever wider. To love those outside of our comfort zones, outside of our families, our communities, our culture. To understand that every man, woman, and child with breath in their body is a child of God. A brother or sister. Just as deserving of the love of God as us. And just as deserving and in need of our love and care as those who already love us. Jesus' golden rule is one that creates within us a divine dependency. A trust in God grounded in our selfless outpouring of love. The very same outpouring of love that God gives to us. From anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. If anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Lend expecting nothing in return. If you give away your coat and your shirt enough times, friends, you're going to be left stark naked. If you give from, to everyone who begs from you, eventually you're going to join them right in line with your own cardboard sign and your own tin can. If you lend without ever expecting anything in return, you will go broke replacing every item that walks out the back door or out of the garage, and good. Because when your feet are cold and your stomach is empty, you'll pray for somebody to give you their coat and a hot meal without asking. Because you'll be dependent on the kindness of strangers, those who will hopefully expect nothing from you in return, because you've got nothing left to give. Because when you've loaned everything you have to those who will never give it back, You'll rely on the generosity of others who will lend to you without question or expectation of ever getting it back themselves. Because then you'll really see where your faith lies. And if you can really depend on God. You see, Jesus, I think, I think paints us into a holy corner with his golden rule. There's not much room in it for us to, to stretch it, to bend it, to twist it, to make ourselves comfortable. Even with a word of reward attached to it, Jesus still calls us to a, a wider, unconditional way of love. Do not judge, he says, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back, or better, for the measure you give will be the measure with which you are measured yourself. Now, most of the folks I know, myself included, if we're honest, we rather enjoy the judging and condemning business, especially folks we believe are outside of what we believe to be right, standing in the grocery store checkout line, Mama with her buggy, little baby there, one on her hip, one on the way. What's in the buggy? Kool-Aid, Coke, bologna, a carton of cools. Hmm. Cannot believe that. She ought to be ashamed of herself. I rather like it. It makes me feel a little bit better about my, my purchase of a six-pack of Diet Dr. Pepper. Makes me feel a little bit better. Personally, I'm a big fan of forgiveness. Well, my forgiveness. I mean, I mean, after all, the things I need forgiving for, I don't do on purpose, right? They're accidents, they're a product of my ignorance. But I'm not so sure how I feel about forgiving other people. Especially those who have shown no sign of remorse, no sign of repentance, no willingness to admit that what they're doing is wrong. Of course, I'm all forgiving, too. 
Provided it's after I've paid my bills, after I've set things in order, and that I verify that every penny will go to people that I agree with, to causes that line up with me. And of course, at the end, I'll get a receipt because it is tax season. See? We're already trying to do it. To wriggle out of Jesus' words. But we can't. We can't. Now, we can just say we don't believe him. That's fair. But we can't wriggle out of his words. We may try. We'll quote every verse of Scripture we can find that backs us up. We'll cite every anecdote we've ever heard or read. Well, so-and-so, I got a cousin that lives over in Georgia, and she knows a person who did this. And see, you just can't trust anybody. And we'll work out the logic. Well, if I give everything away, I have nothing left to give. Well, if I just keep giving my money to every person who asks for it, they might go buy drugs. We'll work the logic out, build ourselves a pretty good case as to why we just can't live exactly as Jesus calls us. But friends, every single time we quote Scripture, you can wake up now, this is the end. Every single time we quote scripture to protect ourselves, every single time we point to some story that proves our point, every single time we work out the logic, there's Christ. There is Christ with his arms stretched out on the cross, naked, bleeding, and dying, having given it all without getting anything in return. Speaking love and forgiveness to the people who nailed him there in the first place. There's Christ, the living and dying embodiment of the golden rule. There's Christ calling us to come join him. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, you call us, Lord, in such simple terms. This golden rule. So obvious because it's at the heart of who we are as people created in your image, and yet, Lord, we try so hard to wriggle free from it. But Lord, help us to see that you did not fight the nails. That you did not fight the cross. That you did not fight death itself to show us your love. Unconditional, unending, and pure. Help us, God, to live by this golden rule you've shown us. The rule of the cross. One that says, Lord, we give of ourselves to the point of death, even to those we may call enemies. But Lord, what else can we do? You did that for us. And what more could you possibly deserve from us? So Holy Spirit, be with us now. Call us into this way of life, this way of the kingdom, this golden rule. And give us the strength, Lord, to live it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.